So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Nicola Di Cosmo, the Professor of East Asian Studies at the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies, the School of Historical Studies. And it's a really huge pleasure and, and, and honor to be able to introduce uh, our speakers in uh, today's STLE lecture in Historical Studies, Professor Ben Elman. Uh, let me indeed um, acknowledge with gratitude the support that we received from the STLE Fund in Historical Studies to host these conferences, which started a long time ago with uh, um, Professor um, Lothar Falkenhausen. <laughs> so we have uh, today a second lecture in East Asian Studies supported by the STLE Fund. Um, ben Elman, Gordon U, 58, Professor of Chinese Studies at Princeton University, a position he has held since 2002. I will say a few word, uh, words in uh, uh, as uh, introduction to uh, his uh, career and, and work, focusing on the most important, uh, most important uh, parts, and um, uh, without any hope to being really exhaustive. Uh, ben earned his BA from Hamilton College in 1968 a master's degree from American University in Washington in uh, 1973, and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1980. In the interim, he was very busy in many, uh, many ways. He spent some time in Taiwan working on uh, uh, classical and modern Chinese. He spent time in Japan, in Tokyo, but uh, he also spent time in Thailand, uh, as a member of the Peace Corps from 1968 through 1971. Uh, ben was a provincial zone office and field supervisor in a program for malaria eradication on the Thai-Burmese border. We at the Institute were very lucky to have Ben as the Mellon Visiting Professor of Traditional Chinese History and Civilization for two years, from 1999-2000 through uh, 2002. Uh, at that time, he was at UCLA uh, Department of History, which he had joined in uh, 1986. Um, after a few years um, as associate uh, assistant professor uh, at um, um, Rice University and a few other positions, he covered the University of Michigan, I believe, and Colby College. There is a very long list of honors associated to the name of, uh, of uh, uh, Ben Elman. Uh, I can only mention a few. In 2011, uh, ben received the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Distinguished Achievement Award, um, which supported, I think, part of your research from 2011 through uh, this year, 2016. Um, he was uh, last year a uh, Tobunken Visiting Professor at the Institute for the, study for the uh, Advanced Study of Asia at the University of Tokyo. Um, he was recently a visiting scholar in Na National Seoul University. Uh, but more, ma more importantly, he was the Changjiang Visiting Chair Professor of Chinese Intellectual and Cultural History at Fudan University, both the History Department, I think, and the Fudan National Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies in Shanghai from 2008 all the way to 2016. Concurrently, he was also visiting Chair Professor of Qing History in Beijing at People's University for five years. Uh, and these are just some of the most recent awards that he has received. Uh, many others, grants, recognitions, and awards uh, have been received by him from the uh, American Council of Learned Societies, uh, the Janjin Wu Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fulbright Program, the Pacific Cultural Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. So this gives you an idea, perhaps, of the fact that um, Ben Elman is one of the most prominent scholars of Chinese history, not just of his generation. The significance of his work is vast, deep, and more importantly, 
um, has fertilized, I think, the field uh, of uh, late imperial and, uh, uh, Chinese studies uh, and intellectual history in ways that is impossible, I th for me at least, to, to uh, fully acknowledge. And it is impossible for everyone, I think, to overestimate. Um, he published his first book in 1984. And um, I think um, for uh, a lot of scholars, uh, this is the book most closely associated to the name of Ben Elman, From Philo Philosophy to Philology, Social and Intellectual Aspects of Change in Late Imperial China. Um, in this book, which stemmed from his doctoral dissertation, uh, Ben Elman reconstructed, documented, and explicated a major paradigm shift in uh, Chinese intellectual history, namely the transition from the philosophical de debates of the uh, 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 Daoshue school, Neo-Confucian school, to a scholarship based on textual criticism or Kao Zheng, uh, and evidential learning uh, in, late, in late imperial China. Uh, this was a very bold new study that offered a brilliant new interpretation of what well, amounted to an intellectual revolution in late imperial China a book that made a profound impression in the Sinological world, both in the East and in the West, has been translated in all major East Asian languages. This was followed in 1990 by another book, another classic, Classicism, Politics, and Kinship, the uh, Chanzhou New Text School of Confucianism in late imperial China, uh, in which uh, Ben, um, deepened, I think, is reconstruction and understanding of the late imperial academic community by focusing on some very prominent uh, uh, scholarly families. In, his, uh, in, in Ben's scholarship, intellectual history also becomes certainly political history and social history. And, um, and he showed how in late imperial China, we really cannot separate these different realms of action and, and, and interaction. The method, the erudition, the scope of the book is hard to convey in a few words, except to say that here again, we have another classic. Um, another critical area of Ben's work has been the acquisition, transmission, and reproduction of knowledge in late imperial China. His uh, monumental cultural history of civil examination in late imperial China, which came out in uh, 2000, is nothing less than a tremendous achievement. An 800 page study based on more than 1,000 examination reports from the Ming and Qing dynasty. A study not limited to the specific scientific, philosophical, historical subjects included in the examination curriculum, but also um, extended to the social organization, the political background, and the psychological dimensions of dreams, anxieties, expectations from success and failure that informed generations of uh, Chinese literati between four, uh, 1400 and 1900, so half a millennium. Finally, I should say a word uh, about um, Ben's contribution to the history of science in China. Uh, and in particular, uh, many studies on the uh, encounter between Western science carried by Jesuit missionaries in China from the late 16th century and Chinese science. His book, On Their Own Terms, Science in China, 1550 to 1900, which came out in 2005, makes a very important point. We cannot understand the encounter between Western modern science and Chinese scientific knowledge without understanding how Chinese intellectuals understood and developed scientific ideas themselves. <laughs> Welcomed as an immense achievement by reviewers um, and, and, and students and readers, uh, this book is truly, is truly amazing for uh, its uh, chronological scope, um, again, erudition, depth of investigation, sophistication of analysis. Um, so I'm going to stop here. <laughs> because, but this brief survey certainly does not exhaust all the areas, all the fields in which Ben Elman's work has been influential. Uh, and yet, I think perhaps it gives an idea. <laughs>
Um, what I've described are all, all these books that I've mentioned are all milestones in Chinese um, studies and especially uh, late imperial intellectual history. Uh, ben is still very active, he's preparing a book on Sino-Japanese and Korean cultural history. He has trained many students who gathered recently at New York University in a, uh, to celebrate um, Ben Elman's in, with a symposium in, in your honor. And um, here at the Institute, we in the East Asian Studies field uh, enjoy uh, a, a close relationship with the university and this also thanks to Ben that we could, uh, we could do that. And uh, not only Ben, many of his colleagues are here, but uh, I am very grateful to Ben for this. So we are very happy to have him here today and please welcome Professor Ben. I think we are all embarrassed by introductions like that. I'm not the only one, so I will, we'll get by it as soon as possible. Uh, I thank you very much for the invitation. I thank the, the Institute and the School of Historical Studies for bringing me in again. I came here in 1999 uh, and was here with, for two years helping Niccolo and others set up an East Asian Studies program, which has been very successful. So I'm very pleased that the mission accomplished, and in many ways we get to see the fruits of that and the interaction with Princeton, East Asian Studies as well. Phil Peterson and Princeton and others were very much instrumental in bringing the two groups together. Later, Martin Kern and others have so-called cashed in on the arrangement. And it's worth served us very, very well. Nicola works with graduate students in uh, East Asian studies. And we also uh, get to meet with the new in, uh, uh, members that come each year to the institute. So it's been a very fruitful exchange. It's been a fruitful exchange in terms of books as well. Uh, the famous uh, East Asian library uh, at Princeton was initially purchased by the institute uh, and then later housed at Princeton. And Princeton later returned the favor by uh, allowing uh, the uh, Institute to house materials on Central Asia. So it's been a kind of inbred relationship, and we appreciate it a great deal. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking about something that uh, has a dark shadow over it. Uh, I put in the word rogue uh, in terms of trying to figure out what scholars do sometimes uh, in certain kinds of situations. And uh, in many ways what I'm going to be talking about today is occurring in beautiful gardens and wonderful bu buildings uh, like this particular uh, academy the Ashikaga Academy, uh, which is not the way it looked originally. This is a rebuilt version of it, but it housed many, many wonderful uh, me uh, medieval books, manuscripts, and other kinds of materials that become very important in our discussion today. So I just wanted to begin with a kind of a Orientalist uh, beginning facade so you can begin to see that something's going on inside that facade and how it's working in that period of time. Uh, the classics, of course, were very central in China. Uh, they were central be politically because one either uh, passed the exams through them and held office, or if one failed and failed over and over again, they became a basis for others to become book bookkeepers, uh, printers, uh, doctors, pettifoggers, all kinds of other jobs came in the aftermath of failing the examination. Most Buddhist monks claimed they uh, never failed the examinations, they just became Buddhist monks, when in fact the reason they became Buddhist monks is they had failed the examinations over and over again in terms of trying to keep going. So even in denial, the uh, examinations in classical learning were very central. The five classics are perhaps the most famous up to a point, but today I'm going to be talking about the Analects uh, associated with uh, Confucius, uh, the Linyu, and why it's called the Linyu, and the fact that there were different kinds of medieval texts available to the Japanese scholars and to Chinese scholars uh, from the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries forward, and how that worked out uh, in uh, commanding attention domestically both within Japan, China, and Korea, and to a degree Vietnam, to talk about Confucian learning and classical learning in the same kind of framework. We associate Europe, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal together in a Latin framework and other languages. And we uh, certainly can't think of anybody that you would leave out of that dialogue. Very often when we talk about China, we leave Japan out of the dialogue. When we talk about uh, Japan, we leave China out of the dialogue. And so we have a history of Confucianism in in Japan, it doesn't really tell us the interaction between China, Japan, and Korea. So I've tried to do some of the things that are involved in it. And some of it isn't very pretty. Uh, some of it shows veneer, veneered uh, scholars trying to gain advantages in fame and fortune on all sides and how it works out. And today, one of the talks is going to be uh, who really owns, controls, and can profit from the Analex from Confucius according to a medieval uh, text that was recovered in Japan in the middle of the 18th century as a manuscript. 
Uh, it was discovered and found at the Ashikaga Gakko, uh, the Ashikaga School, which is about 50 miles north of uh, Tokyo. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, town is a kind of left behind uh, town in the middle of Kanto Plain. Uh, that the major parts of the city have moved toward the rivers. But nonetheless, this was a center for learning and scholarship that uh, we will sort of look at a little bit more carefully. Books were the, the magic name in this particular framework. And if, one, if I can find my materials here. The book we're going to be looking at is here. Uh, it's the Rongo Giso or the Lunyu Ishu uh, collection of annotations about the Analects written by Huang Khan supposedly in the 6th century. A very important medieval text that is available. And this is uh, available with a bunch of other texts. Among the texts that are available at the Ashikaga Gakko are some very important Song Dynasty texts from the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Uh, we often talk about perishability and imperishability. The Song editions, barring fire and damage, will last forever. They'll outlast our computers. They'll outlast most of our informa information gathering machines uh, by, by many, many hundreds of years. And it's fortunate that places like the Ashikaga Gakko in Japan and others were able to bring together rich collections of manuscripts and other kinds of published materials that made available these different uh, uh, teachings uh, by Confucius. But by making those kinds of things available, there were different interpretations and there was competition. Were the Buddhists in control of Confucianism? Was there a separate Confucian voice in Japan that uh, trumped the, the, the Buddhists or not? Up to the 16th century, uh, Confucianism came through Buddhism. And voices of the Buddhist monks were the ones that taught the teachings of the so-called Neo-Confucians and others in the 13th, 14th, and 15th century. It was not until the 17th century that we begin to see Japanese uh, turning into classical scholars in large numbers themselves. There had been small numbers of them before, but in large numbers, they began to displace the Buddhist monks in the exchange between China and Japan. It used to be that the Buddhists were foreign servants going to China, bringing materials and uh, uh, issues back and forth. In the 17th and 18th century, uh, Confucians themselves began to re replace the Buddhists who lost out in the civil wars of that period. And so a new cultural turn was taken and the Ashikaga Gakko was one of the major centers for this kind of framework. And we will look at one text that is arguably from the 16th, uh, 15th century that is based on other texts that come from other places. And these are very, very valuable texts. At times they've been misused. At times they've disappeared for reasons that are not clear. They've reappeared in ways that it's very difficult to get access to them. Very often the Buddhists own a good deal of the classical ancient books of the, Buddha, of, the, of the Confucians. It's very hard to get permission by Japanese. It's almost impossible by foreigners to get access to many of these materials uh, in, this, in the like. But we, we're, we were able to get uh, uh, this particular debate about the Analects of Confucius under control in this period of time. Confucius has been debatable for a long time. He still is debatable. In fact, we have uh, students of Bill Peterson and Martin Kern who are showing that the so-called Analects that we have is not really the Analects at all. It's some sort of composite body of texts that were put together in the first century uh, BC. Uh, here, the belief is Confucius and his disciples in the sixth, fifth centuries compiled all these texts and passed them on to posterity. That was their assumption. That was their raison d'etre. And I'm going to be presenting that perspective based on their belief in that veracity of that particular uh, storyline. So in many ways, we begin to see that the, uh, the ways the Japanese uh, talked about these texts, the way the Chinese talked about these texts, was always with a framework of, we have the best texts, we have the best materials, and we can debate them back and forth. We have borrowed them from you. Now we can uh, replace your interpretations with our interpretations. That's to make a long story short, but the exchange over several centuries was Japan's mimicking and following Japan, China, but also always doing with a sense of, we will do better. We will surpass and overcome these kinds of issues. And among the texts, we've been able to find a number of these in different places. And the uh, Linyu Yishu is one of the key texts that is in this collection. It began in a simple seminar, I think, that Martin Kern set up with Bill Boats uh, about uh, 10 years ago now. I think about 10 years ago. Bill Boats, a very d distinguished philologist, scholar, uh, linguistic, uh, precocious ling linguist who has given us uh, understandings of rhyme and sound in new ways that uh, we didn't know before. And he came for a lecture in February 2006. And he gave a talk about the notion of 
the Amlex uh, in the medieval period talking about how one devised ways to understand the characters, particularly the characters in the title, the Lunyu. Uh, how do we talk about the Lun as a kind of composite set of words that broadcast other kinds of words uh, in, in this context? And so one of the major debates that began to emerge was a precocious notion of philology seemed to appear in the medieval period where they would talk about uh, uh, basing interpretations of a character by looking at, at its sound and re uh, forgetting about its uh, etymology or its uh, paleography or taking a look at its paleography and forgetting about its sound and seeing the different ways of dealing with these issues. There were about three different routes that were followed and one of the routes was to uh, put the paleology aside and focus on uh, the uh, sound. The other was to put the sound aside and look at the paleography and ultimately come up with whether the lun is the lun of uh, this character here with the human radical or the lun with the uh, mouthpiece radical. I'm going to be teaching you a few new notes about Chinese. Most of us have been educated uh, wrongly in Chinese uh, characters for a long period of time. Uh, and the romanticism and orientalism that surrounds China and East Asia in many ways is often associated with its script. Uh, and I think uh, Bill Bolts and others have been very, very important in showing us the importance of paleography uh, uh, and, and uh, the importance of uh, sound, uh, rhymes and the like, but also the notions of glossing based on northern and southern pronunciations and taking into account the local ways of figuring it out. And this was all brought to pair to try to figure out why is the linu, the the analects called the Lunyu, the analects, uh, in this context. And this was something that uh, Bill Boats introduced to us, and he was arguing that this was a precocious uh, form of empirical research uh, in philology uh, on the Chinese language in terms of its paleography, in terms of its uh, uh, phonology, and also in terms of its glossing and dictionaries that were available through glossing. And through this, he was prepared to make an argument about the centrality of many of the later views of the language as coming from uh, Huang Kan the author of this collection that later the Japanese found manuscripts of and putting together a system. So this was going to serve Bill Boats as a way to talk about the march of philology, the march of linguistic studies uh, through texts that were available in, in Japan uh, and elsewhere uh, in the medieval period. And we, would, we, would, we went through this very, very carefully. I remember texts were prepared and graduate students were joining the class. And we looked at this and took it for granted in many ways that unexpectedly, the medieval period had been a very, very prominent field, field of uh, doing empirical research, doing philology in a new uh, flavor, and we were trying to figure this out. I was immediately suspicious, given my nature as a, as a rule. Uh, I usually find things that have truth written all over, them, all over them to be very suspicious. And I took more and more a uh, look at it, and I began to say, but the 18th century uh, figures gave us this text. And by giving us this text, what were they really giving us? Was it really the text of the 6th, 7th centuries? Or were they giving us something that they had picked up from the 5th, 6th, 7th century and then put together in a new kind of way? So in other words, this was almost too good to be true to be a philological storyline story where uh, the uh, Tang Dynasty and previous uh, scholars had made major breakthroughs in understanding how to analyze a classic how to analyze the characters and how to put them together in a way that meant that you could verify what their reading should be. All for the title of the Analect. What does the Lenu really mean? Why, why are the characters in that order? And how does it work in that situation? So Bill worked on this for quite a while. And then I began to take, pick up from it and looked at it a little bit more carefully in terms of where is this text coming from? Uh, uh, he treated it as a text about the Analects without really telling us that it was produced in Japan produced in Japan in 1750 in a published edition, and then sent out again in the 19th century, and sent to Japan, sent to China uh, and other places to be included in the imperial library that was being included, being put together at that time. So it was, it was a good exchange, and, and, and Bill nor normally doesn't suffer fools very kindly, but nor does he suffer uh, people who'd come in and try to tell him he's wrong uh, in many situations. And so over time, we had a good dialogue that went back and forth, and we learned a great deal from this together, and we saw that other uh, scholars in Germany and elsewhere who were following his lead were also taking for granted the sources upon which they were basing their views of the uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth centuries. They're presenting it to us as if it was somehow a clear, transparent mirror, which didn't have makers behind it who, in many ways, put different kinds of glosses in the material that was advantaged. So, based on that one class, 
uh, this was an extracurricular class, as it turned out, we, I began to get involved in this and began going to Kyoto more and more because that's where the sources were to try to figure out what was going on. It still remains a mystery. Uh, I put together one article about the, the techno technical philology. Today I'm going to make the argument that the preface to the, uh, uh, the Analects that Huang Khan prepared is not his preface, that the preface is a false preface uh, that major portions of are written probably in Japan somewhere between the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries, and that the sources for these texts are not in China, they are in Japan. If they're in Japan, how does one get back to Confucius? How does one get back to the Han Dynasty? The trip becomes excruciatingly difficult, if not impossible. So in many ways, we have illusions for the characters that are helping us deal with these issues. Now, just a quick lesson in Chinese for some of you. I mean, all of you know the Chinese language. Uh, we've had people argue Chinese is logographic, it is ideographic, it is pictographic, it's combined. Uh, all these arguments have been lifted. In our own classrooms here, our teachers teach students the wrong issues about language because it's funny, uh, lately interesting, and so they learn Chinese characters in a way that, uh, in many ways, betrays the historical roots of the characters themselves. We all have fun with the characters in certain kinds of ways. Logographic is a little bit more uh, kind of uh, acceptable today, kind of a logos form of writing different ways of issues. Ideographs as ideograms, uh, uh, pictographs, of course, seeing them simply as uh, pictures of particular kinds of objects, and then combining them in different ways. Here, I just wanted you to see some of the techniques of character formation and different kinds of uh, sounds and of, uh, different kinds of meanings coming out of the framework that tells you what order there is to the 10,000 characters, 20, 30, 40,000 characters that exist in China. That they're not all separate pictographs, they're not all, all separate logographs or ideographs. They are formed together with sound and meaning to make sense out of them. And that was the key to trying to understand the Analects by Huang Khan. Here, Huang is one particular uh, 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 pronunciation. Uh, the character is here, and we can see different kinds of markings are added on. We call those the radicals. And the radicals certainly organize the characters in such a way that we can sort of figure out, based on the sound, that this is a borrowing of the sound of Huang, but not the meaning of Huang as go golden or uh, uh, prolific or outstanding, but putting it into a new situation. It's a little bit clearer, perhaps, in these are exact overlaps here. There's, uh, they, they, they're the same in tone, they're the same in structure, and the written forms vary based on what is meaning and what is the sound. With Ma, for example, because Ma is Ma, Ma is mother, we note that they use the, the horse radical uh, for Ma, mother, and that's clearly not going to be acceptable as a pictograph or a logograph or an ideograph. It's simply that the sound Ma was borrowed to talk about mother, and mother was a woman, and we added in a framework of meaning and signification that gave us the source of mother, not as a horse, but borrowing the character of horse to use that to talk about the language. So in other words, these uh, uh, forms of putting two char characters together created the language, not an alphabet, but a way to grow the language so that certain sounds and certain ways of def deflecting the sounds would came across and people could understand what they were often without reading them because they could guess at the pronunciation and they could guess at the meaning based on the radicals that were put in there. Another form was partial similarities in segmental phonemes. Here we see uh, similar uh, overlaps of certain characters, but pronounced slightly differently, uh, bao, uh, uh, chiao, uh, and other terms. But these are put together phonologically. And understanding the rules for their phonological construction allows you in many ways to at least claim that you can reconstruct the language by reproducing these uh, constructions. I'm not saying that I would agree 100%. Uh, Bill and others who have done this kind of thing certainly have expanded beyond this simplistic way that I'm introducing it to you. But the way I'm introducing you to it is I'm saying that these characters are formed through phonetic operations and not simply through semantic uh, ideographs or semantic pictographs. They are there, but they're not the fundamental way the Chinese language emerged as 10,000 characters, 20,000 characters, 30,000 characters. They emerged through these kinds of combinations and from a very early age. Surprisingly, we've seen from the oracle bones and all the early forms of writing, we see more often than not, they were not pictographs, radiographs, they were phonetic compounds or phonetically constructed in terms of radicals with determinatives and meanings associated with them. So I simply want to give you that as a footnote so that you can begin to see the language we're looking at here is not first year Chinese or second year Chinese where students are m memorizing characters for with all kinds of wonderful songs and ditties and made up stories when in fact they have nothing to do with the true historicity of the language. 
Similarly, this happens in Japan and Korea. They add to the storyline. And the characters have a long story. Glymphomancy is a very common disease in China where using characters, making up characters, and interpreting all kinds of different characters becomes a religious obligation, but also a plaything among scholars in trying to sort of laugh at the Chinese language. Now this is the phonology that often gets produced here. And here's certainly one pictographic episode where it's more pictographic than any other kind of logograph or whatever. But you can begin to see that these forms of characters change, changed over time. And ultimately, the final forms that we have in the 20th century, 21st century, uh, certainly carry the, the old memory of the horse in the antiquities, per se. But these are a minority of characters. Very few are formed this way. This is the way we believe Chinese characters were formed mythologically and otherwise, when in fact they were not. More often than not, they come from the six types of characters. Already in the first century AD, we had a paleographical dictionary. Europe doesn't have a paleographical dictionary until the 17th century, when they start worrying about great Greek writing and Latin writing and the forms of books and the like. So the Chinese, because of the massive forms of education, the massive forms of their government, and the need to master classical learning, had to find ways to deal with the characters in such a way that they could categorize them, place them in the proper sequences, and then teach them to those that were going to need to use them. So one would be simple ideographs uh, here above and below in directionality, uh, sort of what we call pictographs, uh, the horse, the mountain, for example. And then we see phonetic compounds, where they bring two characters like the water radical and the name Gong or Jiang into the equation for the Yangtze River. So the Yangtze River is a, a combination of uh, the radical for water and the sound for Jiang. And that gives you basically the Yangtze River uh, uh, overlap as a phonetic element, Gong for the sound. Hui is compound ideographs. In some cases, not the vast majority of characters. But for example, sun and moon are brought together to form bright. So these are cumulative ideographs, logographs, that bring the sun and the moon together. Uh, there's another one of using characters for new words. For example, the word uh, poo or boo for cloth was used for money. Extended meanings were used and borrowed in a very creative way for the, for the language. And then finally, one of the most important features, the jia jie zi, the borrowed character, where the character with the sound of ma was borrowed from horse, and then a new uh, signification was added to the word horse to call it mama is mother, or other kinds of ma to scold and all the rest. Now, I'm not expecting you to have mastered Chinese by listening to my lecture today in doing this. What I'm hoping to do is deconstruct your usual view of the mythology of the language and how it was put together and invented with a whole range of different glyphomatic stories. But in many ways, Xu Shen, who put the six types of characters together, worked on 9,000 characters to categorize them properly paleographically. How right he was? Well, he got some right. He got many more wrong based on our more recent findings. But nonetheless, it was a very useful way to deal with this kind of situation. And I give you this because this is what the Chinese, the Japanese, the Vietnamese, and the Koreans had to deal with to unravel what the language meant to them as well. Uh, and ultimately, which uh, interpretation, which uh, borrowed character are we going to use in different forms. And certainly the Koreans and the Japanese and the Viet Vietnamese introduced new characters into their readings while they mastered the Chinese characters as well. So it was a very fluid situation. And the texts were equally fluid in this framework. The most famous is the oracle bone, which already has all of these kinds of characters encoded in them. There's nothing new uh, under the sun here. And so this is not pictographic language per se, as we uh, believed from the 16th and 17th century forward. But in many ways, this is a very interesting beginning point for understanding how the language evolved uh, after that. This is uh, calligraphy became a kind of uh, art. And so many of the scholars of the 18th century not only became experts in so different kinds of calligraphy, different forms of writing, certain forms of putting sounds and meanings together, but they became interested in the ancient forms as stylistic reproductions of the ancients per se. So the degree to which you could restore seal characters, you were restoring the ancient world of Confucius himself, the Zhou Dynasty, and the time itself. So the calligraphy became a way to restore the past, to return to the past and take this on. And here we, hear, we have Deng Shiru, a very famous writer and calligrapher who became very prominent in the 18th and 19th century, so much so that for perhaps 90% of his work is, is copied by other people. And ultimately, using his name, they make it seem as if it's written by him. But they've just, uh, for the most part, something just borrowed from, from him and taking, taking advantage of his name. <laughs> 
Now let's turn a little bit now to the Japanese edition of the book. And I begin with the tabula rasa because, in fact, there was a tabula rasa. When Bill Bowles came in to talk about this, nobody talked about the book. They just talked about the, the, the rules and the character that were involved in it. And we started talking about the book, and we looked at it very carefully, and we began to see, of course, this is a very beautifully performed uh, text. I have a copy of the 1884 edition here if, if some people want to take a look at uh, it, the version much later. But in this, you can see this is a standard kind of text with the characters uh, from top to bottom and from uh, right to left, read almost as an old uh, bamboo scroll or a wooden scroll. This was modernized into a printing press. And you took the, uh, the, st the, the, the bamboo and the wooden strips, and here, instead of strips, they were simply carved on a woodblock print and then reproduced from this point forward. They were reproduced like this in large numbers already in the 11th or 12th century. So fully 12, two, three centuries before Europe, the uh, East Asian world has a very prominent publishing world. Initially through China, then through Korea, and then later with Japan and Vietnam, uh, we begin to see that all the things we will see and many of the things that we don't see in Western histories of writing and uh, printing, we begin to see many of these things in China already in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries already. And rather than being behind in this particular framework, they're very much on the spot and in the lead in many of these situations. Now here you can begin to see some of the things that are being reproduced that, uh, that Boltz was talking about, you know, uh, uh, using the, the get, getting rid of the, uh, the, the phonology and relying on the paleography to figure things out. And, all, and the other one is to reverse it and to rely on the paleography, getting rid of the phonology, and put these into rule-like frameworks. Uh, we're going to see some of these things repeat, repeat, repeating over and over again. Uh, Lee, for example, look at this is one of the glosses for the character for you or for the first character of the Analects. And there's a, a Lee to it. Uh, there is a, a kind of a, a framework of a, a, a understanding to it that's being glossed in these different lines and being read in this framework. And we're being told by supposedly Huang Kan writing this preface in the fifth century that these are the rules for constructing Chinese. And this is how we are to understand it and to deal with it. Uh, and notice, notice that he says that there were many, many Confucian scholars and many later st uh, students who, who quarreled over this uh, battle. There were three, pro three approaches for language. The first was through phonology, the second was through the, the way of writing, paleography, and the third was local regional pronunciation. And we would go use those three techniques to try to figure out the meaning of the different texts. What they were concerned with was the analects and trying to figure out why is the analects called spouting forth these, I, these words uh, and ultimately what did these words mean and how were they constructed. And this was associated with Confucius' disciples who honored him by compiling the text sometime uh, in the uh, fourth, third century and thereafter. We no longer accept that, but it was accepted for a good two millennia or more. So this text is in, set up in such a way that when we read it, we take for granted that the world behind it is what it is and that this is being produced in a way that is true to the eighth the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth century, and the Japanese have discovered a lost edition of manuscripts in the Ashikaga Gakko, the school, and have used it for the new edition. And this is the new edition that's being used. And it's being sold in Japan, and now being sold to China and to Korea as well uh, in this context. You can see that we, 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 with the graduate students, we went through this very, very carefully, and you'll see why. When we started looking at the text very more and more, it didn't hold up. Uh, it didn't have the, the true voice of the 18th century looking at the 6th and 7th century. It was more the 18th century pretending to be the 6th, 6th and 7th century. Uh, and we began to see different kinds of ways of talking about these issues and how the arguments were raised and reported. And this is a, a Qing edition uh, from the late 18th century. Uh, under the, about the Qianlong period when he was compiling the great library of the imperial Manchu court, that they had this and they used it and it was a woodblock print, very much like a Japanese woodblock print, very much like a Korean woodblock print. And you really couldn't tell the difference uh, in, in, this, in this quality. So what the Japanese did was they compiled the uh, version that they thought was the most correct here and then they sent it to China. And they said, here we are, we're me too's. We've got books and texts and, and manuscripts just like you. And in fact, ours are better than yours. They go back to the Heian period, 11th, 12th century. 
to the Nara period, 5th, 6th, 7th century, the Japanese started buying and collecting through monks and others all these books and materials. And now here in the 18th century, the Japanese are saying, we have a treasure trove of Confucian texts. And people start scouring through them. And one of them is this production by one of the Japanese scholars we'll talk about shortly. And this is what happened to that text in, uh, in China. These are Chinese scholars working with the imperial court and working with the scholars in both Beijing and in Hangzhou in the south, trying to go through this text and parse it and using the Japanese edition and pretending that the Japanese edition is a 6th century edition when it really isn't. It's an edition that comes from somewhere else. So we have different kinds of frameworks here. Uh, and we can see in some cases they say you set aside the character and uh, ultimately you, uh, 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 you set aside the character or you set aside uh, the, the writing forms and therefore you can then figure out the meanings more, more carefully. Uh, and uh, this word shu to set aside became a very, very important construction in religious debates about language and also in terms of philological debates about language. What happens when you uh, put the emphasis on the paleography? What happens when you put the emphasis on the phonology? And what happens when you put out the emphasis on the glossic through the framework? Now we know from Tokugawa scholars in the 18th century and the Chinese scholars that that was the raison d'etre of their philology. How did it wind up in the 6th and 7th century being the voice of medievalists? And ultimately the medieval voice speaking in this language gets to be very, very problematic. Again, going back to the edition uh, that the Japanese produced, we'll move back and forth because lurking behind them uh, are uh, sets of different issues that uh, ultimately go into their publication. And in many ways, the Chinese are taking these texts and turning them into their texts as well in this period of time. And Huang Han uh, becomes a very important conveyor through Japan of what the ancient world was all about. Here we have again, uh, this is the can't know enough, uh, uh, can't know enough uh, collection. He probably should have written that there's never know enough. Uh, rather than can't know enough because he was building this house of cards based on a Japanese edition that he took for granted. And we went through it. There are many different complications and you'll see more in following that it becomes very much more complicated. This is the cover page of the Japanese edition in 1750 then 1864. I have the 1864 edition here which is more or less verbatim uh, the edition but it, it's, it's here and those of you who want to take a look at it can come forward later. Uh, but this is the edition and ultimately we see that the Wei dynasty, He Yan, is the compiler of an uh, important commentary. And then there's the commentary by Huang Khan in the 5th century. And the Japanese scholar gives his own name as the person who compiled the text. So he adds his name to the legacy of the text. And he adds his name as the compiler to this material with the original Chinese who compiled the Han Wei images and then Huang Khan with the version of the 5th century. The, the Japanese are now saying, we're in the number. We're in the same framework. And we are now creating this text based on the information that we have from our manuscripts and other kinds of materials. This is the uh, preface. I'm sorry it didn't come out too, too, too well. Uh, Tori Nankaku, a good friend of the, the author uh, in, in this situation, goes through this and talks about how they had often made trips to the Ashikaga school to find new texts and new materials. And they found that, in many cases, they had been lost in China uh, for whatever reason. The wars, the invasions of the Mongols had destroyed many texts in the north and also in the south. And so Hattori, Sako, Hattori Nankaku was boasting about uh, Japan in this period of time, saying that uh, it will not only benefit J China, J Japan's understanding of the classics, but they'll also understand, uh, help us understand China's understanding of these classics to go back. In so many ways, the Japanese are teaching the Chinese uh, things about texts that they have lost or no longer maintain. And the two are intermeshing, but how they intermesh is what we want to see next. Again, this is the, uh, this is the 1850, uh, 1864 edition. I can see that the Wei, 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 Wei dynasty, He Yan, is the compi compiler of a con commentary. Huang Khan is the compiler of another set of, of commentaries afterwards. And the, the, the Japanese scholar, the Japanese scholar here is made uh, the author through uh, uh, adjudicating and putting different pieces together. This is the version without these markings. And these, this, Japanese love to mark up their books. And so this is a, a later edition that they were able to get in, in, in Japan and mark it up. Uh, but in many ways, it's the exact same version that went to China. 
and we want to watch very carefully what happens to the authors as we move through the Chinese uh, reception. You can see here, this is basically the same. Uh, the organization is basically, I'm sorry, let me go in there. These two editions are the same, but let me go through them individually first. This was the Japanese edition. And then we have the Chinese edition in Hangzhou. And we have Wan, Wan Dang Wang listed here. So do we have He Yan, we have Huang Kan. There's no Japanese scholar. He's, his name has been dropped. He's no longer included in the gestation of this. And Wang Dang Wang is, in many ways, a very important figure. He's a governor, a provincial commissioner. And uh, he, he wants to produce the text of the Analects. So he comes up with a pocketbook edition. Why? Because the millions of people who are taking the examinations, he's going to produce the pocket version of the Analects and try to get credit for it. He's going to become culturally heroic in this situation. He dies in 1781, executed by the emperor for his corruption. And so the receiver of the books in Hangzhou is in many ways trying to make a go of it by producing these books, getting rid of the Japanese scholar's name, and naming these in his own name and putting them together. And we know this from the career. Wang Dang Wang had a more conspicuous de de career as a smuggler, as a corrupt official, than as a scholar. But nonetheless, he salvaged his reputation in perpetuity by a, 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 getting rid of the Japanese writer, who was, should have belonged here for the compilation, and replacing it with uh, Wang Dang Wang. That's your first rogue. Okay? Wang Dang Wang's your first rogue, and he's an authentic rogue. Uh, he's, he's a corrupt, uh, dangerous fellow who works with Klishan the great uh, uh, corrupt Manchu uh, uh, court figure who uh, manages to put more money in his own home than the entire realm has in its own treasury uh, in this period of time. So it's a remarkable situation. And, and note how it overlaps with scholarship. Wang Dawang is not just satisfied with controlling the trade between Gansu and uh, the southern, in southern China. Uh, he wants to control the market for getting credit for the best edition of the Analects that's being used in the uh, examination system. So we can begin to see the commercialization of the uh, examination system in funny kinds of ways in the production of the two. So these, although they look different because of the Japanese editions of type of text and right now, like they're exactly the same, only uh, the Japanese author is gone, Nemoto is gone, and Wang Danwang has replaced him. A fiction of sorts, did Wang Danwang think he could get away with it? Apparently so. Uh, and uh, he put the edition together and ultimately didn't live long enough for the text to be made popular. This is the, the Imperial Library. And the irony of the Imperial Library is the printed books of China and Japan were given to the Imperial Library. And the Imperial Library re -took, made them into manuscripts. It was too expensive to print all these books, so it made them all into manuscripts. And they included many of these in the manuscripts that they wrote up in this framework. Here, for example, the Wei Dynasty version of the uh, Analex we're talking about. He Yan is here and Huang Khan is here, but there's nobody. They've decided they're not going to adjudic adjudicate this case. There's no Japanese scholar author, and there's no Chinese scholar like Wang Dang Wang. They're just going to say, we accept the text as is uh, in this situation. Okay. Here also we can begin to see that in the uh, European uh, uh, in, in the uh, Japanese, in the, I'm sorry, in, in the framework of the imperial, imperial collection, uh, there's only one person involved in this version uh, for the author of the preface. It's only Huang Kan. There's no mention that, as in the Japanese edition, that the Japanese scholar Nemoto was also involved. So here, now, the uh, preface to the analects that they're producing is now attributed to only one person, the medievalist Huang Kan. The uh, Japanese even, and the, the Chinese others are ripped out of this, and no longer can we have a historical trail in the same place. This is a Japanese text. They send this to China. China reproduces the characters and the columns and the, the, the frameworks of the text, but you have a, a war going on underneath in the footnotes over who's going to give credit for this and who's not. Again, this is the Sukul Chuan Shu manuscript copy. Note that the printed versions, as they come to the imperial court in Beijing, are now being turned into manuscripts. And the manuscripts are what the, in five or six major collections, are the major places where these materials will be held. It costs too much to put, put woodblock prints up for all these thousands of books that they've collected in the imperial court. So they return to the manuscript 
Okay, now I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this one because I don't have as much time as I thought I would, but there's a couple of uh, sections in the Analex which are very famous. One of them is of talking about the, uh, the ED tribes with their rulers and the Chinese states without rulers. And the metaphor here is in many ways to say that the ED, the barbarian tribes with their rulers are not as good as the Chinese without rulers. In other words, Chinese are civilized. They don't need rulers. And so in this gloss here, Wang Danwan puts together a different view of that. And he says that in many ways, the ED, uh, the, the tri barbarian tribes with their rulers are superior to the Chinese rulers. Why would this be? Would the, this be a, me a special message sent to the Manchu emperors who are in charge of the city at this time? And Man Wang Danwan, of course, is trying to save his rear end. Uh, from uh, the execution that he's going to shortly face. So he's taken a Song Dynasty gloss, put it into the text, and ultimately tried to claim, this is how we should interpret it. Emperor, this is why we honor you in this context. The other text that we have on the other side is the original text that was uh, probably from the medieval period, where indeed the argument was, we, the, we Chinese are better without rulers than our barbarians are with their rulers. We are superior to them. So this battle back and forth is in many ways also telling us there are Mongols, there are Manchus, there are Jurchen, there are all kinds of people in the background of these dynasties and in these groups, and we want to be able to understand what's going on. And someone with the machinations of Wang Dan Wang could tell the ruler, say, to the child, see, you are better than the great Zhou kings who ultimately succumbed to the barbarians of the first millennium BC. So this text is being manipulated in a funny kind of way. Did they not think that we at Princeton would look at them more carefully and try to understand what was really going on here? Well, why didn't they think that somebody would look more carefully, probably in, in Korea or in China or in, in Japan? And in, in the end, they turned out to be wrong. People did look at these things very carefully. And the versions that were put into the uh, uh, framework were, in many ways, denials of Zhu Xi's version. Zhu Xi lived during the Song Dynasty. It was not a p period of uh, peace and, and, and wealth and growth. He lived in a period when the barbarians ruled uh, most of North China and then later all of South China, the Mongols and others. So he made the, the emendation to the text saying that the barbarians are better than we are with their rulers. We are chaotic and incapable of ruling without our own groups. But anyway, the text is now beginning to be debated in terms of these political backgrounds. And people are using Jushi's gloss, which is a much later gloss, to try to explain what the original meaning of the text was. They're telling the emperor what he wants to hear. Or better put, they're telling the emperor what they think he wants to be here. And in many ways, the emperor says in the end, is this OK? Or, this is wrong, isn't it, right? When he talks to some of his best uh, Hanlin academicians and the like, and they ultimately, the Chenlong emperor decides, I can't fool everybody. I have to go back and indicate who's cheating whom here. And ultimately, this Wang Dan Wang is the culprit we'll need to get rid of, not only because of his corruption, but because of his manipulation of these texts. He's, he's made them uh, very, very difficult for people to accept. Okay, that, that's as far as we go with uh, Bernard Fuhrer. Bernard Fuhrer has, has carried us this far before, and so I just I want to make sure we give him credit for his study of this passage and ultimately blaming the Chinese for the manipulation of Japanese texts, which is fair enough. The rogues are on the, the, the Chinese side. OK, now let's go to the actual edition. This is the edition in the Ashikaga school of the preface, so-called preface and beginning parts of the Analex by Huang Kan. Those of you that can read Chinese can see there's no preface. There's the first chapter of the, of the Linyu, and it goes right into the text. There's mention of He Yan, and there's mention of Huang Kan as important figures, but there's no, there's, no, there's no there there. There's no index. There's no preface. And wh where did the preface come from? What's going on? It introduced a new set of problems here. And slowly but surely, as we began to look at this particular edition, the preface is up here. It's in these lines and materials that are being written into the text and on top of the text. And we have to sort of figure out, well, why is the preface there? The Huang, Huang Kan is from the fifth century. This is a 15th, 16th century text. What's going on? And who's manipulating what in what text that's going on? So we were faced with this text, and we have to deal with it. For the most part, it was interpreted as uh, the text itself 
is there and it's written into the borders of this version, it must be coming from somewhere else in the paleographic game. And we have different versions being produced in other places in Japan. Here's a version of the Analex without any of the marking radicals. Uh, they just say, you don't need radicals. We go back to the original characters and write it that way. So Japanese are already playing around with these characters because they have different pronunciations and they have different characters that fit those pronunciations. We'll see, for, for example, Huangkan in Japan is Okan. Uh, and so they use a different character for that. And so the writer of the piece is no longer Huang. It's called Okan. This is the markup we began. We got copies of this material. And we began to look at it. These one, two, three, four, these are parts of the preface of most editions. And we go through this, and we have to figure out what's going on, how did this work, and when did they put this in, and what's going on. But we have to figure out how did they invent the preface? Where did the preface come from? And we have to trace it down. And remember, this has been included in the Chinese edition. This has been included in the Japanese edition without any tell anybody telling you. But you know, we, this is what we were working with. Uh, we had a very difficult framework to compile. They just sort of give you the results and tell you this is what we did. These are different parts. Remember, we talked about the, the meaning of the Lun. For Lun, they give you different uh, meanings here. This is in the preface that we have later published, almost verbatim. And then this is very often the explanation for the use of characters as paleography and the use of characters for phonology and also the different uses of the meanings of the terms. Sp squashed inside of the text that it's supposed to be representing. And you're, you're trying to figure out who's fooling whom here uh, and what's going on in terms of presenting this kind of thing. The manuscript is valuable, but how did this get here? Who did it? Who put it in there? And we begin to sort of begin to wonder 16th, 17th, 18th century, uh, who has control of these materials and how are we putting this in? The, the Sorai school, for those of you familiar with Ogyu Sorai, is usually blamed for this kind of thing because they went around looking for all kinds of texts in all kinds of places. The Buddhists wouldn't let them see the text they had because they didn't trust Sorai and the other Confucians in the sixth cave. But nonetheless, we are now having to reconstruct the text. Rather than having a text that we can interpret, which is what the philologists were doing, we now have a text that before we can even understand it and uh, deal with it in terms of its meaning, we have to reconstruct where it came from, how it works. Uh, and so this story of this text overshadows the story of what the content is. Again, we can blow this up all you want. And if you look at it more carefully, those of you who know the Chinese, you can see that the idioms and the terms of paleography, the phonology, the uh, glossing of characters are written into this already. And probably this is uh, around after 14th, 15th century, perhaps. But what's the origin of this material? Is it from Huang Kan's original? Is it from another Japanese version? We now begin to have a different story, a different set of problems. We begin to do these kinds of what's missing, what's there. Uh, we can see that the black version is the version that they used in the, uh, uh, in the earlier version of the, of the Analect. The red version is Nemoto's changes. And Nemoto's changes are considerable when we compare them to the original that we have from the Ashikaga Gakko, Ashikaga school. Where did he get the added characters? Did he make them up? Did he dream about them? Jushi would read a text for 30 years and then claim that he could figure it out. Here we have a different ball game. We have people who basically are getting manuscripts and trying to figure out what they mean and what they represent. And we can see that over time, the Ashikaga manuscript version is being increased in terms of the number of characters saying the same thing. The brevity of the earlier version is too brief and too unclear. So we're beginning to have the construction of the text in Japan. It's part of the Ashikaga tradition. And the Nomoto has been working with the Ashikaga text and also other texts as well. This little strip here, buried here, turns out to be a very important uh, philological statement that they you know, basically focus on the character or they focus on the, the, the rhyme, the, the sound, and they can bring them together to form the rhyme and the meaning of the sound and the meaning to get the right answer for what the Lunyu was, what the Analex was, and other texts. So this is sitting here, written in by somebody. If this is Huang Kan's uh, original uh, writing of the 6th, 7th century, it's very unlikely that this text would have that kind of textual history going on. Meanwhile, there's a new text that's emerging from a Buddhist temple in Kyoto. Many of you have probably been to the Manshigin, which is very near uh, the northeastern uh, area of uh, north east, northeastern part of Kyoto in the mountains uh, near the palace, the, the gardens that are located there. 
And there it turns out there's a complete version. It's not called the, the Lun Yu Yishu. It's not Huang Khan's Lun Yu. It's called the collected, the general uh, brev brev brief summary of the uh, Analects that they put together in this period of time. So in other words, the most complete version that we have is the green version coming from a Buddhist temple. And the Ashkaga version is the most incomplete. And yet this one claims, as we will see shortly, to be from the 12th and 13th century. This one claims to be from the 15th and 16th century. How come the one in the 13th, 14th century is better and much clearer? It has all the, all the correct characters if the claim that it is a 13th century text is uh, believable. This is the text that people appeal to to argue that this goes back to uh, the 11th, 12th centuries. And this is the key to going back to China, getting back to medieval China, and figuring things out. Note here that uh, uh, Khan is now called Wang Khan, uh, O Khan. That he's no longer called Huang Khan. The name has changed. The text is Da De, the Great Virtues. There's no mention of the, the text as a preface. This is a summary probably used by Buddhist monks when they lectured on the Analects. And it survived of sorts in this context. The claim here is Kama, Kamakura. It's a Kamakura text uh, in this context. And parts of it have been printed. But this is the most uh, ancient text that we have, claiming to be from the 13th century, that possibly uh, then was used in China in the 15th and 16th centuries to revise and produce the new version of the uh, Huang Khan, now called the Wang Khan subcommentary. What happens when the Japanese just say, no, it's not Huang, it's O. And I put in the, the, the character for O because that's what it means. Who has the right to do that? Who can say that that's right or wrong in that situation? The Japanese, that's the way we say. We speak O, O is O. And so they're reading into this their own readings. But what we also see is that in, in, interspersed in this manuscript from so-called 12th, 13th century is the language of philology, the language of setting aside the character and focusing on the sound. Uh, also going after the uh, setting aside the uh, sound and focusing on the uh, pale 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 paleography of art. So we have the highlights there. The characters are all there. They're just too, too, too diffuse. They're written in, in uh, Soroku's so uh, special script in Japanese. But you can make enough to see that this sub commentary contains the content of much of the preface. But it's not even a preface. It's something else. And so we have to go back to this text and try to figure out what's happening. This is where the Japanese have left the, 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 the question. Uh, they argued the green version from the temple in Kyoto is the most complete version. Of course, it is. That doesn't prove what date it is, but it's the best edition we have of these so-called arguments and claims. And the version by Namoto, he must have been had access or to another version. There were altogether 35 surprise, surviving versions. He must have had access to these materials to ultimately keep his version going and ultimately produce it and send it to China. Meanwhile, nobody knows about the Soryaku, the Manchuyan temple version, until much later. And that's the one that's the Ur text. That appears last, and uh, nobody tells us about it uh, until suddenly the scholars in the 19th and 20th centuries begin to say, well, where does this text come from? Before we can make claims for it, what are we going to do about it? And that's the mystery that's left right now, is to try to figure out where this Manchuyan version were, is in this story. Will the Manchurian let you see this manuscript? No. Will they let you date this manuscript? No. Uh, a friend of theirs was cryptically al allowed to, to Xerox the materials. Uh, so that the version I showed you is, is Xerox from the 10 pages or so of this manuscript. Very short manuscript, 10 pages. And yet, that's where the Ur text is. And we've located the Ur text is, now the question is, so what? And so let me, just in closing here, tell you that uh, I've decided that it's uh, not the original preface. And that the evidence is, evidence is circumstantial. But that's always true in philological discussion. Somebody's going to find something at some point in the next millennium that will refute you, supposedly. But until then, you know, we bet on uh, what we think is going to happen. And so in this situation, the, 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 the question of, I guess if you can read that. I can't read it very well from there. Uh, we have to sort of figure out why does the, the, the version, the Soryaku from the temple, associate the philological material with the sub-commentary and not the preface? It doesn't even mention the preface. Well, the, the preface is the, the sort of the agency of the author. 
and the preface is the agency of Huang Kan, and they don't even make any mention of it. Why was the preface missing in all the other 15 versions of Huang Subcommentary in Japan? In other words, there's a war between 25 manuscripts and 15 manuscripts. They're different. And they're all about the same time, and they're all about the same period of framework. Which one is the most reliable one? And why would the Japanese, to this point, welcome these texts from Japan without changing anything but the people's names? Everything else is accepted verbatim, and they accept it and say, we did it. We wrote it. We published it. And so in this context, we're trying to figure out why the Chinese accept that in, in, this, uh, in this framework. OK, and then why is Huang Kan's phonological and paleographical methodology both so pro precocious in his preface and so underutilized in his subcommentary? If this is a powerhouse methodology, and you've got this attack in terms of using paleography, using phonology, and using uh, uh, terms from dictionaries and the like, which is happening in the 18th century, why wouldn't you do it anywhere else? In other words, the entire text of the, anal of the Analects that we're talking about, the introduction is only about four or five pages. And they take this powerhouse methodology and apply it to only one thing, the title of the book. There is not a single place in the commentary where they use this methodology. That, for me, seals the deal right there. That, in many ways, this use of this methodology, this use of evidential research, this use of paleography and phonology for figuring out why is the analects called the analects, and then the rest of the book, not a peep, not another suggestion. So somebody's playing games here and thinking they can pull a fast one by simply putting it through on the preface. So what I'm saying, for many ways, is that the commentary and the uh, materials from the actual analects, there's no problem with those, I don't think. There are problems here or there. But the real problems are the preface. The preface is not uh, believable, given what we know about the situation in that earlier period of time. Also, who is Huang Kan? To be a great philologist, we would expect there'd be some story about him as a great philologist. There's not. He's basically a figure interested in Taoism and uh, Buddhism, and the three religions are one kinds of theories. And he's not known for his philology until suddenly somebody discovers this text and argues Huang Kan must have been a genius. And Bill Boats and others are ready to anoint him, the Tang Dynasty medievalist, ready to uh, deal with this. I shouldn't uh, laugh at uh, Bill. Anybody would get, get caught in that, that particular set of problems if they didn't look at it carefully, per se. But I think before you can get to Bill's arguments, you've got to go through all these hedges that's going on. Now, that's where the story stands right now. And uh, I'll certainly take questions on this also. But what I also want to add is that the meanings of the terms also become problematical as we look at these issues. What Usually when you say to set aside the character or set aside the, the, the sound, we're talking linguistics. We're talking language, right? But normally the, the debate in the text that come, come from the earlier period is language versus truth. And so we get rid of the language because that's the only way to get to the truth. Of course, that's good Zen Buddhism, Chan Buddhism, uh, to argue that the text is irrelevant, is secondary. And in fact, the more text you read, the more you get the distance you have from enlightenment. So in many ways, what we're saying in this Taoist Buddhist claim is we get, we get rid of language so we can become enlightened. And that's one of the predominant discourses that we've got in this discussion. I've talked to Buzzy about this a little bit. And it, it, it's, it's more complicated than, than I'm saying at this particular point. But I think one of the things we're talking about here is it's not just a linguistic argument. It's also a kind of a metaphysical argument about the role of language in reality. And in many ways, when you say set aside language or set aside the, the problems of language so that you can achieve enlightenment, that's very different from them saying set aside the phonology, set aside the, the, the paleography. That's a linguistic statement using the same structure. Normally, I would assume that, that paleography uh, phonology argument is coming later. And these earlier arguments about language versus truth, language versus metaphysics, is coming much earlier. But the language is setting aside. Also, I wanted to sort of indicate that all we know about the, the version of the Analects from China that uh, wound up in, 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 in China and then we copied from, there's no text from before 1750 that corroborates anything in the text that they put together in Japan and then recopied in China. Everything you find on search engines everywhere is from the 1750 edition and later. There is no finding uh, of these texts and materials or statements in earlier sources. Remember, Hong Kong said there were lots of scholars and lots of students that were debating this issue. Who? Where? 
when. We don't have any evidence for any of that. Now, suddenly, in the midst of all of this, about a, three or four years ago, and Federico will like this, I think, I discovered Mori Rishi, a scholar of the 19th century, who was basically writing about pharm pharm pharmaceuticals and trying to keep pharmaceuticals straight in terms of using the kanji, the characters and the like. And he wrote this book about the study of the commentaries to the Materia Medica classics. And he stated his methodological approach as follows. Set aside the characters and choose the sound. Set aside the sound and choose the, uh, set aside the, the, the sound and uh, choose the, 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 the overall sound and put this together. And it begins to be his, mon his mantra for saying, on the basis of the tone, I get the written form. On the basis of the written form, I get the meaning. And Maury makes no reference to anybody. This is the closest you come to the argument. And yet it's been structured in such a way in Japan that he either knows and is not telling us or doesn't know and doesn't tell us anyway what's going on here. So this is something we, with search engines, we can go through and figure things out as we figure out what's going on, the different roles of these texts and meanings in this debate. And right now, uh, one of the problems is to figure out why Mori Rishi is, is using this in the late 19th, the Meiji period, for talking about pharmaceuticals and how to about, uh, give the proper names and uh, dosages for the medicines that are involved. So anyway, there's a lot more to do in this, as I've indicated here. But I'm willing to, to argue now that the, the preface attributed to Huang Kan is not Huang Kan's commentary. It's something else. But that's not true for the rest of the text. Anyway, I'm sorry to have given you this tale of philology. I'm hopeful that uh, most of you didn't fall asleep completely. But it's an interesting problem of setting up something that before you can really evaluate the text, you have to know what's going into that text. And I think more, more often than not, we take text for granted, and we really shouldn't. Okay, thank you very much.